So yes, hyperbaric is an amazing tool. And yes, it could help us heal from a multitude of different health issues that people might be experiencing. And yes, hyperbaric can also help improve our performance, mental performance, our physical performance, our cellular performance. And while it can do all of these amazing things, too much is also possible. And if we get too much oxygen, we could reach a point considered to be oxygen toxicity. And that's what I wanna to cover today. So there are two types of oxygen toxicity, central nervous system oxygen toxicity and pulmonary oxygen toxicity. And as both of the names imply, they are affecting different systems. So central nervous system oxygen toxicity affects our brain and central nervous system, while pulmonary oxygen toxicity specifically affects our lungs. Central nervous system oxygen toxicity was first described by Paul Burton in 1878. And this is really understanding the effect of oxygen in a short period of time based on a dose that's too high in that moment. In other words, we've already described how oxygen is diffusing across its gradient from high concentration to low concentration. When the pressure of oxygen, which is really what creates that gradient, when the pressure of oxygen starts to exceed certain limits, it has the ability to create toxicity symptoms in us when we're exposed to that. So I wanna show you this chart. So this chart is just a gradient of PO2. And what it'll show you is that on the low end, around 0.16, so if the pressure of oxygen, the PO2 is 0.16 or below, technically that's considered hypoxia. Next would be a PO2 really, it's not on this chart, but a PO2 of 0.21, that's where you and I live right now. So air is 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. And so 21%, 0.21 is the pressure of oxygen in the air that you and I are breathing currently. As we move along the line now at 0.5, that becomes the beginning of where we would start to track pulmonary oxygen toxicity, if that was a concern. And then as we, we skip along, we get to a PO2 of 1.6. This is where central nervous system oxygen toxicity can occur. Now, there's a difference between central nervous system oxygen toxicity in a scuba diver versus central nervous system oxygen toxicity in the clinical patient in a hyperbaric chamber. So it's a lower threshold for that working scuba diver. They're exercising and what's happening is they're producing a lot more CO2. I'll get into that in a minute. And the more CO2 a person is producing, the more likely they are to become oxygen toxic. So that's why there's a discrepancy between the scuba diving, the exercising central nervous system oxygen toxicity and the uh, clinical central nervous system oxygen toxicity. So it's a PO2 of 1.6 for the diver and a PO2 of 2.0 or above in the clinical patient. And then if you see, we can skip along to the end of that chart and it just shows you that at a PO2 of 3.0, that is human tolerance. We would never need or want to ever go above a 3.0 PO2 and expose a human to higher levels than that. There are very few treatments, carbon monoxide poisoning being one of them, where it's this acute life-saving event where going to the human tolerance is actually necessary to save that life. Other than that, almost all clinical treatments are done well below uh, 3.0 PO2. So that gives us that range. And, and since we brought it up, let's just talk about that oxygen is a vasoconstrictor. In other words, when we get higher levels of oxygen, our arteries tend to constrict. And that's really, a, you know, in some ways, a defense mechanism against the amount of oxygen that we're being exposed to. And that has a lot of actual benefits. So there are times where we're trying to control swelling or edema and having that vasoconstriction will actually help reduce the swelling and edema associated with, with certain traumas. At the same time, that vasoconstriction also reduces the amount of oxygen that ultimately ends up in our uh, brain. While oxygen is a vasoconstrictor, carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. And so that's the issue with this central nervous system oxygen toxicity is that the body is trying to vasoconstrict because of this high level of oxygen. But if you start to rebreathe a little bit more of your carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide vasodilating increases the blood vessel diameter to our brain. And now we're getting vasodilation and this very large increase in oxygen to our brain. And that's ultimately what sets off the symptoms of central nervous system oxygen toxicity. Again, at a, in a clinical hyperbaric chamber, we're looking at a PO2 of uh, 2.0 or above. And so if you're a chamber operator or a doc working in a hyperbaric clinic, 
as a patient gets to close to that 2.0 and above range, that's really when we're supposed to be keeping an eye on our patients, a close eye on our patients, and looking for the signs and symptoms of oxygen toxicity because this is something that's very easily avoidable. It's something we can help, you know, especially in a off-label use of hyperbaric where these are not life and limb threatening conditions. We can monitor these signs and symptoms and we can get people off oxygen well before they actually experience central nervous system oxygen toxicity. There's really no rhyme or reason to when somebody's going to get central nervous system symptoms. So you could have somebody that's done the exact same dive and they're on their 15th or 16th session and all of a sudden have symptoms of CNS oxygen toxicity, or, you know, it could be their first session or, you know, they could have it on their third session and never have it again. We don't really know all the reasons that uh, stimulate CNS O2 toxicity. And it could be that it was just a bad day. Someone didn't sleep as well. Uh, maybe they were dehydrated or started a new medication. So again, there's really no exact equation that we can solve to figure out exactly when someone's going to have this problem. All we really know is there's a, about a limit that this becomes more likely to occur, and we need to kind of keep an eye on it at that point. Just to put this in perspective, the likelihood of central nervous system oxygen toxicity, even across all metabolic conditions and comorbidities that people have, is, is basically somewhere between one in 10,000 to one in 50,000. So even with that, it's, it's not like this is a very common phenomenon, but it is something that's very important that we keep an eye on because to avoid this in the office in general would be to keep patients safer and obviously to keep patients also more comfortable. Also, the, the signs and symptoms of oxygen toxicity are always reversible, okay? So CNS O2 toxicity is always reversible. Even when you, when you see that, you'll see the list of uh, what those symptoms are you know, seizures is one of those uh, signs and symptoms. And so this doesn't mean if somebody had a seizure that was a CNS O2 toxicity seizure, that does not mean that they're epileptic. It does not mean that they need to go see a neurologist and get evaluated and start, you know, medicine for uh, epilepsy. It's literally a moment in time due to an increased exposure to oxygen for that moment. And as soon as we remove the oxygen source and wait a few minutes, those signs and symptoms will reverse. And again, it doesn't make them more at risk for having this happen again in the future. There is one thing I want to talk about. It's called the off phenomenon. And really what that is, is you might be watching a patient in a chamber and you might see some, you know, a little bit of some twitching or some eye movements or, you know, starting to see the beginning of oxygen toxicity. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop that process before it continues on. And certainly if we can, before a patient might have a convulsion or a seizure. So what the off phenomenon says is that as soon as you start seeing signs and symptoms of oxygen toxicity, you immediately get them off oxygen onto regular air. And when you make that transition, the PO2 drops dramatically, except that they already absorbed all this extra oxygen so that there's about a five minute window from the time that you take someone off oxygen until you've basically cleared the potential for further signs and symptoms of CNS O2 toxicity. So uh, we basically pull the oxygen and we wait five minutes and then we can decide what the next steps are. In some cases, it might be just put them back on oxygen and let's see how they do. In some cases, it might be, okay, you know what? We're gonna call the session, bring them back to the surface, come again you know, tomorrow or the next day and, and continue on from there. So it's just important to know that you could remove the oxygen and still have an increase in the signs and symptoms associated with CNSO2 toxicity, not to worry, just wait that five minutes and then you should be in a good place to make a, a clinical decision on what the next steps need to be. And then lastly, I just wanna show you what the actual signs and symptoms are of oxygen toxicity. You know, if you are running a hyperbaric clinic or you're a technician in the clinic or you're involved in the patient care, this is definitely something, I mean, you just need to memorize these. You just, you need to know what they are and you need to be watching for them. As a technician, your main role is to be watching patients for the signs and symptoms of oxygen toxicity. So here is the list. And this is basically, you know, this is your role. And this is how we know uh, that patients are starting to exceed their limit on that particular day, on that particular session. And as soon as we start to see them, you know, shut the oxygen, remove the mask, or if you're in a hundred percent environment, you know, then you would put a mask on to deliver the air. Either way, switch from oxygen to air, drop the PO2 and wait those five minutes and then you'll be in good shape. You'll know what to do next. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. And next we'll talk about pulmonary oxygen toxicity.